Hi, welcome back and I hope you uh, have had a good break between the last message and this one. And as we continue to go into the scriptures, let's just uh, open up in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. We just honor your name and we glorify your name. And we just, as we search the scriptures, we ask that you speak to our hearts and minds as well as our spirits. Allow your good and pleasing will, your word, and your ruach, penetrate our hearts and our minds during this time. So as we continue with our message today, Lord, we ask that you be glorified in all things. In Jesus' name we pray for now and future generations. Amen. Okay, so <clears throat> the last um, message finished off on the uh, passage about Matthew chapter 13, verses 16 to 17, saying that the Father has revealed this to you, which is a kingdom dynamic and a revelation for those who are attuned to what he's doing and saying during the season. So let's start with a, a, another kingdom dynamic which will help us go into today's message as a as an opener. It's taken from Esther. Now remember over the last few uh, weeks, over possibly the month, you know, I've been encouraging us to go deeper into uh, the scriptures, hear his voice, see what he's doing and saying, because sometimes he reveals those things to those that are attuned and willing to hear and willing to take that step of faith. But in the book of Esther, we can appreciate that she had a very uh, unique calling on her life and she was asked to save the Jews from certain destruction. And this is where she helped and she agreed and she was rising to her destiny. Taken from Esther chapter 4 verses 1. When Mordecai learned all that, he had, that had happened, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city and he cried out with a loud and bitter cry. He was obviously very upset about um, the, uh, the, the disaster that was pending, not only on uh, the uh, communities but also the nation. And Esther was called for such a time as this and a kingdom dynamic which tells us about rising to meet your destiny which is part of biblical woman, allows us to appreciate that Esther was a Jewish orphan, a virtually non-entity, raised by her cousin Mordecai, with no particular promise. But the account contained in the book unfolds the way God opens up destiny to a person who will keep his priorities. Even in the presence of recognition, success, wealth and luxury, an environment many may covet. But which has so often proven destructive to spiritual commitment, Esther retained her sense of perspective and integrity. Esther's Hebrew name was Hadash, which means myrtle, referring to the well-known and beautiful evergreen shrub. She reflected the myrtle in her courage and obedience, which clearly did not wither, even when she faced death. In Persian, Esther means star. Again, Esther's beauty, her grace, and character shone, bright and unwavering, against the darkness threatening the Jewish people. Note, Esther's response to Mordecai's call to recognize God's providence in her placement. She believed God, not her beauty, had put her on the throne. And her respect for the power and prayer and fasting. She recognized the reality of the spiritual realm and the Holy Spirit's resources. Her un wavering will to lay down her life for others and her practical good sense and patience in pursuing her enterprise laying down our lives reminds us of someone else in the new testament doesn't it <laughs> so anyway as we open up with that uh, scripture keeping that scripture in mind firstly rendering our hearts not our garments to our heavenly father and also to appreciate that you've been raised for such a time as this you know, Esther was called to save her people. Well, it's the Lord's people. But she saved the nation from certain destruction. And she stood against what was being said and done in those times, which would have caused a great calamity. But because she knew who her God was, and because she had faith and trust in Him, she stood her ground and she made sure that no one was going to perish. And she was uninvited and she went up and she sought counsel, which you can go and speak, uh, read a little bit more about in Esther chapter 4. But this message today is about faith, it's about duty, and it's about the lessons of the kingdom 
that we can appreciate. And if we turn our attention to the New Testament, looking at the book of Luke, chapter 17, speaking of faith and duty. We're going to read from verses 5 through to 10. And the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. So the Lord said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted into the sea, and it would, would obey you. And which of you, having a servant plowing or tending sheep, will say to him when he comes home in, in from the field, come at once and sit down to eat? But will he not rather say to him, prepare something for my supper, and gird yourself and serve me till I have eaten and drunk, and afterwards you will eat and drink? Does he, th does he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded of him? I think not. So likewise, with you, when you have done all those things which you have commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. Appreciating this little passage of scripture allows us to uh, uh, learn about the disciples and their felt need for the greater faith for uh, the meeting of Jesus' uh, standards or his demands. And faith is a huge thing that we have been pressing into, learning a little bit more about, and exercising as we go into the promised land, looking forward to what he may be able to do, not by our power, not by our strength or might, but by his Holy Spirit, says the Lord. In uh, Mark chapter 11, verses 22, we can appreciate the, uh, the word faith. Strong's Accordance 4102, which is a conviction, a confidence, trust, a belief, reliance, trustworthiness, and persuasion. In the New Testament setting, pistis is the divinely implanted principle of inward confidence, assurance, trust, and reliance in God. And all that he says. The word sometimes denotes the object or content of belief. If you want to learn a little bit more about uh, this uh, passage that tells us about the word wealth, you may turn your attention in your devotion time, your quiet time to Acts chapter 6 verses 7, chapter 14 verses 22, and Galatians chapter 1 verses 23. So the amount of faith is not necessarily um, as important. It's not about the amount, it's about the quality. And the quality that allows us to have faith in God, as opposed to the amount of faith that we have in God, is the priority. It's that quality. It's like quality time. And those who obey the commandments of God, cannot make special claims upon God for merely fulfilling their duty. But it's about making your request known to Him. And God's rewards are one of grace, not of merit, but we appreciate that because He loved us first, we want to do things for Him that allow His name to be known. John chapter 11 Verses 1 to 44 is quite a lengthy passage of scripture. Where a Samaritan woman meets her Messiah. Sorry, not, uh, sorry, <laughs> that's another good account. But uh, John chapter 11, verses 1 to 44, speaks of the death of, of Lazarus. Now we're speaking of a physical death in this passage of scripture, verses 1 to 16. Bethany, located about two miles east of Jerusalem, and during the final week before the crucifixion, Jesus spent a lot of time there with his friends Lazarus, Mary, and Martha, which allowed him to, again, allow them to spend quality time with him. Another example of divine sovereignty amid human suffering, demonstrating God's purposes and grace through Jesus' response through these scriptures. And Jesus' uh, delay of two days underscores what he had taught, which was a consistent teaching. 
and I'll let you look at what the consistency was in terms of when Jesus did things, where he did them, why he did them, and who he did them for. Jesus did things according to what his father had revealed to him. And in this passage of scripture, in verses 1 to 16, goes on talking about friends, who in this case was Lazarus, as well as those uh, enemies that still never deterred him from his path that the Lord had set before him. Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? And if anyone walks in the day, how does he, he does not stumble because he sees the light of the world. But if one walks in the night and he stumbles because the light is not in him. These things he said, and after that he said to them, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I make, may wake him up. And then he further on went to say that Lazarus was dead. And he was glad for, for their sakes that he wasn't there. That they may believe. So they saw someone who was physically dead before he arrived. And then he said, well, nevertheless, let's go to him and see what we can do. So with all that in mind, we appreciate that... Um, he is the way, the truth, and the life. And a little further on in John chapter 11, verses 17 through to 27, we'll read. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. And many of the Jews had joined the women and around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been there, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? He is pointing out a faith question. You know, sometimes we lose loved ones. The loved ones that we lose, we love a lot. But as with Lazarus with that physical death, and he was raised after four days. As with Jesus, when he went to the, cru uh, to the cross, crucified, raised in three. My prayer is that if you've lost a loved one, near or far, that the Lord will be the comforter during this season, but that your mourning be turned to joy through your loss of that loved one here on earth, but a celebration of their life, not only here on earth, but also in heaven. Because another saint has gone up into the heavenlies to be received once again by his loving arms. So whether it's a loved one that you've lost recently or a little while ago and still recovering from that loss. My prayer is that you'll see that physical loss as an eternal joy. An eternal restoration that allows that loved one to be received well and to be celebrated, who no doubt will be shining down on this earth, sharing their love with you every day, every step of the way. You know, the rising of Lazarus was not a resurrection from which endless life flowed. We all have an infant, we have a finite time here on earth. That's our body. But as mentioned with both Lazarus and Jesus, Jesus was resurrected to eternal life. And Lazarus, no doubt, would have had the same experience when his physical life eventually came to an end. But it's reserved for the Father in both instances to initiate their resurrection. Lazarus, when he has his uh, second uh, experience of death that goes to eternal life, and Jesus. This inaugurates a new order of life to which those that in Christ 
are still looking forward to in hopes. So no matter what the circumstances are, when we have Christ in us, it's him that will be able to keep us going, keep our light shining. So when Lazarus' death came, eventually, after being restored to physical uh, life, those that have died in Christ can appreciate that they have an eternal inheritance where he said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Christ's people are the ones that will have that waiting and hope, faith and love, knowing that he's gone to prepare a place for us. And those that have gone into the heavenlies and gone home to be with the Lord, they've got their full reward. So take heart, take comfort, and have healing through these words of Jesus. Because it's a walk by faith. We walk by faith and not by sight. And sometimes we have the illness that we're not sure or knowing what the outcome is going to be. Or we have the plan and the hope that we have. Not, not sure how it will come to pass. But trusting and making sure that we are ready and equipped. These are the things that help us exercise our faith. Most important thing through the Gospel of John was he was saying, believe. Just believe. You know, faith helps us with our understanding of the Scripture. But more importantly, it allows the Holy Spirit to work in and through um, our lives, whether it be um, through our devotion with Him or actively as we continue our journey. And faith, like love, is evidence itself in obedience so if you have love love is a choice and we finished off the message um, in our last message saying it's about love who is love God is love so no matter what our history or past has, has um, uh, given us when we have love we understand that God is love and appreciate that through his son Jesus and the Holy Spirit, they can manifest themselves in our lives. Having that love allows us to receive not only the, the, the love of the Father, Abba Father, but also the wonderful workings of the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, and the Holy Spirit. So when we have faith, we can approach the throne boldly. We can Approach God. We can approach Him boldly and request. Give our request to Him. But then we take that step of faith in action. Sometimes that step of faith can be daunting. can raise a few um, thoughts of uh, doubt. But then we go back to the Scripture. If we have fear, we go back to the Scripture. Not being given you a spirit of fear, but of love power and sound mind if it's doubt refer back to joshua refer back to the book of john how they both in the old testament give an account of how to silence the unbelief as well as in the new testament through the the, the gospel of john is allowing us to believe so there was a time where jesus then uh, withdrew because there was a plot to kill him. Let's look at uh, John 11 verses 45. Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary had seen the things Jesus did and believed in him. But some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things Jesus did. And the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, What shall we do? For this man works many signs. If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and nation. One of them, Sophias, being high priest of that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for all the people, and not that the whole nation should perish. Now this he said, Do not say on his own authority, but being a high priest, that year he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation and not for the nation alone. 
but also that he would gather together in one of the children of God who were scattered abroad. Then, from that day on, they plotted to put him to death. Therefore Jesus no longer walked openly amongst the Jews, but went from there into the country near the wilderness, to a city called Ephraim, and there remained with his disciples. And the Passover of the Jews was near, and many went from the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. Then they sought Jesus and spoke amongst themselves as they stood in the temple. What do you think? That he will not come to the feast. Now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a command, and if anyone knew where he was, he should report it that that, that they might seize him. So annually, uh, the, the the men, the men of Israel, they go and they uh, celebrate the festival, the three main festivals, as well as the other ones. But they're called to go up to Israel to celebrate the, the three festivals. So when you're called, be obedient to that call. Hear what God is saying to you, whether it's through direct revelation or whether it be through the prompting of the Holy Spirit. But they, in this case, went up and a lot of them did have a problem with Jesus because of the signs and the miracles that he was performing. Meantime, it wasn't in his own strength. He was just relying on his father and his father was doing the great signs and the miracles. But what was going on there? They wanted to kill Jesus. Let's have a look at Luke. Luke chapter 17. Speaking of healing. <clears throat> Luke chapter 17. Verses 11 to 19. The lepers were cleansed. Now it happened as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of the Samaria and Galilee and as he entered a certain village there he met ten men who were lepers who stood far off and they lifted up their voices and said Jesus master have mercy on us. So when he saw them he said to them go show yourselves to the priests and so it was that they went and they were clean. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned with a loud voice, glorifying God, and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan, so Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except the foreigner? And he said to him, Arise, go your way, your faith made you well couple of interesting messages there that we can appreciate is that um, of the nine who didn't come back, there was one who came back and gave glory to God. But the others, you know, uh, perhaps um, Jewish or uh, the like, felt the, the healing was their due since they were of the chosen race and had no need to come back glorifying God or giving thanks. The ingratitude didn't only uh, deny Jesus' mercy and Christ. Uh, Mercy and, and the healing to the nine. But they, this deprived them of actual fellowship with him, time with him, quality time with him, being able to walk with him, to walk with Jesus. And the foreigner in this context was the one who came back and gave thanks. But maybe the nine, that, uh, the nine lepers that were healed represented the nation of the people who were ungrateful, ungrateful and unresponsive unresponsive to the, the dealings and the workings and the, the healings of Jesus and his ministry as the Messiah. They, they contrasted with the grateful response of their um, Samaritan neighbors. But he said, your faith has made you well to that one, the foreigner who came back. And that referred to the salvation. The salvation that maybe didn't even bring the health healing, but it brought eternal salvation. The nine may have received their physical healing, but they certainly didn't uh, receive as much as what the, the foreigner did, the one foreigner did, because he received eternal life, because he knew 
who, who gave the healing and where he could glorify the healing. The healing was to his father, to God. Jesus was just the, um, the vessel to be able to bring the healing. Now, I mentioned earlier on about uh, how powerful prayer can be for healing. is when you align yourself because he said, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, freely receive, freely give. Set the captives free. So in this passage of scripture, the nine walked away, claiming it was probably their, uh, their right, their, 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 their privilege as a chosen race. But without gratitude for what the healing occurred, would have maybe just helped them physically, but not spiritually. It was that heart. The last message I spoke of, the finger of God, the heart of the matter, the healing that comes through the New Testament life in Christ. The Old Testament was all about the law with the commandments and with the many other laws that they uh, put on themselves. So much so that they were trying to observe the law so much that they missed the healing opportunities that was available for all of them. And when they were healed, they didn't give thanks. So here's some kingdom thoughts. Is healing for the Jews? Or for all people? I think we've answered that question in the context that we read the passage of Scripture in Luke chapter 17, verses 11 to 19. And when they made reference to the nation of being unresponsive and unbelieving, which nations would you pray for to ask them to turn their hearts back to Jesus, to the King of King, Lord of Lords, to the Abba Father? I pray for the Holy Land, both in Israel and all over the world, because everyone has an invite. Everyone has an opportunity, but it's a choice. And it's a step of faith that people take in that process. Is Jesus exalted amongst the nations as of yet? If not, why not? More importantly, the question is how can we intercede and pray for the nations? Whichever nation it is, including the Holy Land including all the nations. If Christ isn't yet exalted, it's okay, because it says that he will be exalted until his enemies are under his foot. And for those that choose to reject him, persecute him, and kill him now, like they did back then, is having an impact on this whole world. Because this whole world has Christ inside of them. Every single human being has Christ inside of them. And here they come with plans and the schemes of the enemy to steal, kill and destroy. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. So what are they trying to do? They're trying to do it again. They're trying to do it again. And when we have our hearts and our minds attuned back to him, we can appreciate what he did, what the Father did through him, and the sacrifice that he paid for our sins. There's some valuable lessons on the um, coming kingdom. And if we turn our attention to Luke chapter 17, verses 20 to 37, it's a little bit of a read, but it's good because it's got a lot of passage of scripture of what Jesus was talking about and uh, we'll read from Luke chapter 17 verses 20. Now when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come he answered and said to them the kingdom of God does not come with observation nor will they say see here or see there for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. Then he said to the disciples, The days will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. And they will say to you, Look here and look there. Do not go after them or follow them. For as the lightning flashes out of this one part, 
under heaven shines to another part under heaven, so also the Son of Man will be in his day. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, and they were given into marriage until the day of Noah erected the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was also in those days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day of the Lot went out from Sodom, and it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he who is on the housetop and his goods are in the house, let him not come down to take them away. And likewise, the one who is in the field, let him not turn back. Remember Lot's wife? Whoever seeks his life will whoever seeks to save his life will lose it and whoever loses his life will preserve it i tell you in that night there will be two men in one bed and one will be taken the other will be left and two women will be grinding together one will be taken the other one left and two men will be in the field one of them will be taken and the other one left and they answered and said to him where lord so he said to them wherever the body is there the eagles will be gathered together. He, would, he was addressing the urgency and the need, not only for repentance, but for a, a, a renewed heart and a renewed mind. Because there was a coming of the kingdom, but, they, but he was trying to express to them that the, that the kingdom was inside of them already. If we look at a kingdom dynamic, we can appreciate a few things, which is the message of the kingdom. Fundamental to New Testament truth is the kingdom of God is spiritual reality and dynamic availability to each person who receives Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. To receive him, the king is to receive his kingly rule, not only in your life and over your affairs, but through your life and by your service and love. The kingdom of God is within you, Jesus said. This is never to be construed as possible if we operate independently of God's power and grace. The possibility of reinstatement to rulership is brought about only through the forgiveness of sins and full redemption in Christ through the cross. The Bible never suggests either that there exists in man a divine spark which may be fanned to flame by noble human efforts or that godlikeness is somehow residual in a man's potential as though human beings are or may become gods. To the contrary, man is lost in darkness and alienated from God. However, full salvation brings restored relationship to God and full potential for his kingdom's ruling within us. And as we walk with him, Jesus has sent the Holy Spirit to cause the anointing of his Messiahship to be transmitted to us. So, so it is. On these terms only that the human being can say, the kingdom of God is within me. Now, I just want to go into a couple of things. But as I was reading there, I was just led to share something with you. Is that, um, and I'll read it again. His kingly rule, not only in your life and over your affairs, but through your life and by your service and love. So there's love again. So when you have love, you have the kingdom of God inside of you. Yes, we still walk on an earth that is broken, dark. But he's asking us. He's asking us, what's in your heart? Remember the finger? <laughs> the finger that wants to bring the healing? Heavenly Father, we just include this prayer. That this message will touch somebody who's listening to this, this, this sermon. And they'll know the good and pleasing will of you. Who abides in them already. Before they even knew you. You were already with them Lord. And as you are in them. Through your unconditional covenantal love. We ask that they keep it pure. And keep it safe from harm. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. So, 
we can appreciate all these good things that, that tells us that he wants to heal us. He wants to allow his Holy Spirit to work in and in through us. But the kingdom isn't an external or physical um, uh, life, such as a political domain or anything other, but rather an internal and spiritual transformation. Yes, we've got all these things. You know, we've got political parties vying for power and control, yet they don't fully appreciate that they may at times be going against God's will. And that's where Esther rose and she met her destiny, was saying to those leaders, stop. Within you may mean within your mists, and that's where it comes about through the presence and through the worship, through to our Abba Father as we lift our hands and worship him in spirit and truth. That's where he is in our midst. And Jesus is saying that the kingdom is presently embodied in him. So it's in him. But the fact that their unbelief still remained, which is something that they failed to recognize. The consummation of the kingdom is basically awaiting for the, the Lord's return when he comes back for his bride. Remember the spotless bride? And sometimes we are weary. Sometimes we are tired. But the believers will often long for that day, knowing through faith, hope and love, that we will have victory, even victory over death, as shared earlier with Lazarus and those that we love and have lost. But until the Lord returns, we've got to continue with faith. We've got to continue standing standing our, our ground, as Ephesians 6, having done all to stand, locking, interlocking each other with, uh, with, with uh, great faith. Great faith, knowing that he's coming, but not knowing when he's going to come. No one knows the day or the hour except the Lord. We are to avoid discussions and uh, circumstances that are pointing towards a specific date and time because no one knows it but his coming will be as quick as a lightning strike that's how quick it will be and by that time if you haven't made your choice to love the lord your god with all your heart with all your mind and with all your soul and love your neighbor being the second greatest commandment this is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. Love the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your soul. That's the greatest commandment. They said, what's the second? Love your neighbor as you love yourself. All about love. We're coming back to the subject of love. But we must believe and live expectantly for his return, whether it's in a lightning strike right now or who knows when. But in contrast to the carelessness and the unexpectancy of Christ's return and the readiness for his return, people may still have routine pursuits that may give the impression that it's permanent, but it's not. It's fleeting. It's temporary. So when we go after the eternal, we go, we go after the primary. Yes, we've got to do what we can while we're here, because we have only been given a certain amount of time. But when we have a, an attachment that isn't so secure and tight, and we're holding on to earth uh, loosely, allows us to be able to receive his kingdom and receive the willingness to go back home or take that step into the promised land, or just having trust and faith in his providence and in his provision while we continue that account of Lot's wife was just a testimony as to how um, when we are tied to worldly possessions as with Lot was when she looked back at what she was going to miss materialistically she turned into the pillar of salt you know the church's secret rapture will happen in an instant in, an, in a blink of an eye 
And there will be a decisive separation between those that the Lord will call home with him and those that, as with Sodom and Gomorrah, didn't believe and continued in their ways. So perhaps maybe the time and the manner of the fulfillment of these um, things that have yet to come, which is not indicated, but perhaps maybe seen in conjunction with a, a revelation in the book of Revelation. And if we go to chapter 19, verses 14. Speaking of Christ on the white horse. Now there's going to be horses that are going to come back. But Christ on the white horse will be the one that we're looking out for. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. I'll let you read the whole passage of scripture of chapter 19 which speaks about a number of things, such as Christ on a white horse, as well as the Holy Scriptures and the spirit of prophecy. Let's have a read through that so that we can go deeper. The entire Bible is a product of the Holy Spirit, who is not only the spirit of truth, as found in John chapter 16, verses 13, but the spirit of prophecy, as found in Revelations chapter 19, verses 10. And the verb to prophesy, which is derived from Greek preposition pro and verb femi, means to speak forth before. The preposition before in this use may mean in advance or in front of. Thus to prophesy is a proper term to describe the proclamation of God's word as it forecasts events. It may also describe the declaration of God's word forthrightly, boldly, or confrontingly before a group or an individual, telling forth God's truth and will. So, in both respects, the Bible is prophetic, a book that reveals God's will through his word and his works, as well as a book that reveals God's plans and predictions. This text defines the witness or testimony of Jesus himself as being synonymous with, or at the heart of, Spirit of prophecy. And these words not only define scripture, they also confine all the utterances that claim to be true in prophecy. And Jesus Christ will be at the center of it all, <laughs> as he is in the whole Bible. The Old Testament exists to reveal Christ. The New Testament is inspired by the Holy Spirit for the same purpose. So going back to that passage of Luke, which is the coming of the kingdom, we can see that there's different views as found in uh, Luke chapter 17, uh, verses 20 to 37. And 37 says, and they said, and, and they answered and said to him, where, Lord? So he said to them, wherever the body is, there are eagles that will be gathered together. What was he speaking of there? He was speaking of the judgment, the symbolism of judgment. The birds that were gathering there that was referring to the spiritual decay that was happening. And depicting the church also as being snatched up, heavenwards, heaven bound, as a bird snatches its prey. So there's a lot of uh, great meaning behind eagles and, and vultures in these three ways. I'll repeat, first to symbolize judgment, gathering where there's spiritual decay, as well as depicting the church being snatched up, heaven, heaven, heavenly bound. So as we start looking at closing off today, we're going to be looking at another parable about the repeat, as I've said before, of the persistent widow, the Pharisee and the tax collector. Luke chapter 18 verses 1 to 14 tells us uh, that there's a, there's a message on the way to Jerusalem that Jesus was talking about. The parable of the persistent widow allows us to appreciate the prayer, the steadfastness that guards against the this, this dishearted uh, during Christ's uh, return, delayed return. But it also gives us the hope that as Christians and as believers, 
We are not to go grow weary in waiting for the Lord, but also to pursue, uh, persevere in faith. Verses 9 to 14 tells us of the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Sometimes not all prayer is genuine, but the attitude is more important than the persistence. Jesus concerns the mistaken identity or notion that righteousness is a human achievement instead of a gift from God. Righteousness is found in him. The prayer, which is similar to the prayers prayed each day by the Jewish men, included thanks for not being a Gentile, actually, and also not being a woman. And some Pharisees went beyond the requirements of the law by tithing even what they had bought. If they made goods or uh, things that were included in their tithe, but the sinner was just sinner. He was just, he realized that he fell short to the glory of God, but it was God who worked through all things for those that love him and are called according to his purposes. And if God's for us, who can be against us? So when we come out of that place of sinning, bondage, slavery, captivity, illness, into wellness, into health, good health, We appreciate that we're all sinners. We've all been sinners. You know, there is a great parable when we realize how much he loves us. Parable of the hidden treasure. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, and for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys a field. But what about the pearl? The parable of the pearl of great price. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. That stresses the value of the kingdom. The value of the kingdom is so precious just like a pearl. And Jesus, being the purchaser of our lives, paid it all. Paid the sin, paid the debt to secure the kingdom. But here's what I want to end off on. Jesus was vulnerable. He healed. He did great miracles. He was beaten he was taken to the cross he was hung on a cross but he did that because he had a great his father had a greater plan and he was just obedient being obedient to his father and as we'll learn in the next couple of weeks it was what he said that made all the difference in the world even though there was a sign above his head saying king of the jews written both in greek and latin and Hebrew. A kingdom dynamic that will finish off on today is speaking of vulnerability. And that's leadership traits. Being vulnerable as a leader means to stand totally open as a human being, hiding nothing and refusing to defend oneself. Few things elicit more of a response from people than a sense that they are dealing with someone who feels their pain and understands their need which they discover only if the leader is vulnerable enough to disclose as much. When Jesus refused to defend himself the night of his arrest, Peter's protective action severed the ear of the high priest's bodyguard. Immediately, Jesus reached out to heal his enemy, making himself vulnerable to a return sword thrust, since his reaching for the man's head easily could have been interpreted as another hostile move. Vulnerability may expose one to misunderstanding, but it will also bring healing. Let those with ears and eyes hear this message, this message of the kingdom, this message of the gospel, and this message about going into your internal, eternal inheritance. Internal and eternal.
because he loved us first. And who is love? God is love. Right from the beginning, right to the end of this truth. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord, and we just, we stand in awe. We stand in awe for who you are and what you do and the life that you bring, Lord. And we just ask that the hearts and spirits and minds are softened so that you can speak tenderly and lovingly to those that need to hear you. Lord, as it says that the kingdom of heaven is within us and the kingdom of God is within us, allow us to manifest that. Manifest the love. Manifest the unforgiving areas in our lives turned into unconditional forgiveness. Which then brings the unconditional love. Which brings healing. Which brings joy. So Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time together and we just ask that by your holy name, those will come into your presence. And those that have yet to come into your presence, do so, so that they may be baptized through the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And as we enter the promised land and give you thanks while we're doing so, we just give you all the praise and glory, for you're a good, good Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, steps of faith, being obedient, having that love, having that healing. Sending you all the love in the world.